and there it is. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Lee Arnold, and welcome to He's the Solution Ministries. Glad to have you all here with us this morning. Uh, if you would, please open up your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 2 as we continue our study uh, over the course of the next 66 weeks, I guess 65 weeks now, uh, in the book of Isaiah. So, all right. So some recap from last week, just some things for you to be aware of. Uh, the book of Isaiah is expansive, dealing with virtually everything that is involved in being a people of God living on this planet Earth. The impressive art of Isaiah involves taking the stuff of our ordinary and often disappointing human experience and showing us how it is the very stuff that God uses to create and save and give hope. As this vast panorama opens up before us, it turns out that nothing is unusable by God. He uses everything and everybody as material for his work, which is the remaking of the mess we have made of our lives. The name Isaiah uh, means God saves. And the prominent themes repeated and developed through the vast work are judgment, which we are going to cover in chapters 1 through 39. Uh, then we will jump into messages of comfort, which are chapters 40 through 55. So if you guys want to read ahead, you're welcome to do so. Uh, judgment can sometimes get a little heavy. <laughs> so if you need a, a break from judgment, you can uh, fast forward to chapters 40 through 55. Uh, and then chapters 56 through 66 cover hope. Okay. Uh, Jewish tradition tells us that Isaiah's father was King Uzziah's brother, and we know that Isaiah frequented the court and was close to a number of kings. He and Hezekiah were good friends, so it's very possible that he was of royal seed. The book of Isaiah has been called the Bible in miniature. There are 66 chapters in, I in Isaiah, just as there are 66 books in the Bible. Chapters 1 through 39 talk about the shortcomings and sins of the people of Judah and Israel, and they deal with the law and the government. Just as the first 39 books in the Bible deal with the law, government, and the shortcomings of God's people. But in chapter 40 of Isaiah, suddenly a new, a new direction is taken. For there we read, comfort ye my people, and love and grace are introduced. In the 40th book of the Bible is the book of Matthew. So, just some um, review points for you guys as we were introducing Isaiah last Sunday, uh, but this brings us to chapter two as we continue. Uh, let's read the chapter together. Isaiah chapter two, uh, beginning in verse one, and again, as a reminder, guys, I am reading out of the NIV, the New International Version, so if it sounds or reads different than what the, the translation that you're looking at, uh, just kind of follow along, and I'll try to give you uh, verse references just to make sure we're all in the same spot. So Isaiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between the nations and will settle the disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Verse 6, you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob. They are full of superstitions from the east. They practice divination like the Philistines and clasp hands with pagans. Their land is full of silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. 
Their land is full of horses. There is no end to their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. Verse 9. So man will be brought low and mankind humbled. Do not forgive them. Go into the rocks, hide in the ground from dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. The eyes of the arrogant man will be humbled and the pride of men brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Verse 12. The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and they will be humbled. For all the cedars of Lebanon, tall and lofty, and all the oaks of Bashan, for all the towering mountains and all the high, he high hills, for every lofty tower and every fortified wall, for every trading ship and every uh, stately vessel. Verse 17, the arrogance of man will be brought low and the pride of men humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day, and the idols will totally disappear. Verse 19, men will flee to caves and the rocks and the holes in the ground from dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. In that day, men will throw away to the rodents and bats their idols of silver and idols of gold, which they made to worship, and they will flee to caverns in the rocks and to the overhanging crags from dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. When he rises to shake the earth, verse 22, stop trusting in man who has but a breath in his nostrils of what account is he? Wow. All right, let's pray. Lord, we just come to you now as we uh, open up your word. Lord, asking that you would give us clarity to understand uh, what's going on here, and, and Lord, what it is you want us to hear and to know and to see, Lord, that you would speak to each one of our hearts, Lord, you know what baggage we brought here this morning, you know the things that we've been wrestling with, the things that have been causing us worry and fear and anxiety, Lord, you know all of those things, and Lord, I just pray that as we open up your word, as we look at this chapter, Lord, that you would bring insight into all of those things that uh, perplex us and challenge us and, and, and grieve us. And Lord, that we would be attentive, that we would be open to hearing what you have to share with us this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would just keep the distractions this morning at bay. Lord, it never fails. We open up your word and this distracts us or this thing interrupts us and Lord, just help us to avoid any of those distractions this morning. Lord, we, we know that you speak to us through your word when we come to you intently to hear what it is you would have to share with us. So, Lord, we just come. We open up our hearts to you, uh, Lord, as you teach us. And, Lord, more than anything, I pray that you'd help me to get out of the way. Lord, nobody cares what I think or have to say this morning. We just want to hear from you. So we commit our time to you this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, as we continue our study here, uh, for, for my note takers, which I do encourage, uh, I would encourage you guys, Isaiah's chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5 are actually one prophecy. Okay? So over the course of the next couple of weeks, we're going to be studying a single prophecy as it relates to the rebuilding in the temple in Jerusalem, as well as the end times and what that looks like, okay? Now, does the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem need to be rebuilt before we are raptured? That is the question, right? So as we look at God reestablishing and ruling and reigning, uh, again, this relates to the millennial reign of Christ. So this is post-tribulation. The, the, uh, the saints who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior have now been ascended, the bride of Christ, and now Jesus is coming back to rule and reign. This is the thousand-year millennial reign where he will do this from Jerusalem. Uh, the question, again, is does the temple have to be rebuilt before 
we as Christians, the bride of Christ, are raptured home? And the answer is no. It does not need to be rebuilt. So a lot of people are, are under the assumption or the impression or the belief that the temple needs to be built before the tribulation. Not actually true. And I'm one of them. I thought, okay, well, we, you know, we need to wait and see when the temple's going to be built. No, the temple does not need to be built before the rapture because the temple could be built during the tribulation period. As we know, the first three and a half years of the tribulation are going to be some of the most uh, wealthy years that have ever existed on planet Earth. Uh, we know that during this three and a half year period, there's going to be great peace. Uh, everyone's going to be getting along because the Antichrist is going to lead the entire world into peace and, and harmony and prosperity. And I believe that if there was ever a time of peace on earth, that such a beautiful structure, as I believe this temple will be, is going to be built. It could be built during this tribulation period, the first three and a half years. Now, I don't know if that's the temple that would obviously be established for the millennial reign of Christ, because we know that the second three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation are going to be some of the bloodiest years that the earth has ever seen. So even if they get the temple built in the first three and a half years, could it be potentially destroyed in the second three and a half years? Yeah, potentially. And while we could speculate all day long, uh, it's one of those non-essentials because it's not a requirement that the temple be built before the tribulation takes place or before the rapture takes place. So I really don't care. But there is an interesting point. Now, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you no doubt have gone to the Temple Mount, which is now currently under Muslim control, uh, where you have the Dome of the Rock. Now, when we were in Jerusalem in January of 2018, and we went here, you know, I'm sitting here, and it's under Muslim control, so we had to go through security, uh, security as controlled by the Muslim nation, to go into the Temple Mount area, which is this, it's, it's, it's the most incredible, I can't even explain it with words, it's just so incredible. Um, but to, to think that there would ever be harmony there, that this new temple could be built is crazy because you can't, when you go through security, if you're wearing any crosses or any signia related to Christianity, you have to remove it. Uh, our daughter Andrea was wearing her Valley Christian sweatshirt. That's where they go to school. She had to turn it inside out because there'd be no mention of Christ on the Temple Mount. And it's, it's, it's contentious, and that's that's putting it mildly. It was almost to the point of unsettling. It just I didn't feel safe there. And to think that this is the location that Jesus will rule and reign for this thousand years, but understand that this is the area that Isaiah is referencing here in chapter two. Uh, at this time, there will be great peace at last. During this millennial reign, there will be great peace. Now, we see here in chapter, uh, where is it, uh, verse, chapter four, verse four, it says that plows will be beaten in, or swords will be beaten into plowshares, and spears will be shaped into pruning hooks, because during this thousand-year reign, there will be no war. There will be no Annapolis. There will be no West Point Training Center for uh, training the troops. There will be no Pentagon. Not, won't need them because everything will be under the Lord's rule and the Lord's reign. Okay. So with that as introduction, let's begin our verse by verse look at what's happening here. So verse one. Uh, this is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the last days. Now, something to be aware of. When Isaiah speaks of Israel, Judah, and Jerusalem, he means exactly these people and this place. Judah means Judah. Israel means Israel. And Jerusalem means Jerusalem. If Isaiah uses figures of speech, he will make it perfectly clear 
that they are figures of speech. The prophet will let you know when he is making a different application. Now, why is that? Well, the book of Isaiah is one of the most studied books in all of history. More scholars, more people have studied Isaiah than any other chapter in the entire Bible. Isaiah is referenced 250 times in the New Testament books, and it is quoted 54 times by authors of the New Testament. So from a, a reference point, Isaiah is used more frequently than any pastor, any bishop, any pope, anyone than any other book in the Bible. Because of that, it is often misquoted or misconstrued. And what Isaiah says, people will say, well, he didn't really mean the people of Judah. He was referring to this group of people. He didn't really mean Jerusalem. He was just referring to the Middle East. So they'll, they'll try to dilute what Isaiah is saying to help it support whatever narrative or whatever sermonette that they're trying to get it to fit into in that moment. But you guys are all biblical scholars. You have to be to get up this early and hang out with me every hour on Sunday morning because you just want to learn more about what's happening in the Bible. So you need to know that Israel means Israel, the nation and the place. Judah means Judah, the nation and the place. And Jerusalem means Jerusalem. You know, J. Vernon McGee, in his commentary, he said this. <clears throat> the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. This pertains to the nation of Israel after the church has been removed. The word mountain in scripture, if you guys want to write this down as a note item, the word mountain in scripture means a kingdom, an authority, or a rule. Now, Daniel makes his, this clear in his prophecy. He says, the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. That is above all the kingdoms of the earth. So the reference here, while well, yes, it is the mount, uh, the temple mount in Jerusalem, which by elevation is not the highest mountain in the world. So that's not what's being referenced here, but rather the mountain of the Lord refers to all other nations will bow to Christ's established kingdom. That is above all the kingdoms of the earth. The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will be king of kings and Lord of lords. Now, one of the reasons that today Israel is such a hot spot, if you've ever wondered why why so much attention on Israel, a tiny little nation that is smaller by landmass than the state of New Jersey, which is just this, you know, little tiny state? Israel, I mean, the, the place that so much throughout history has occurred, why is it such a sensitive piece of real estate? It's because it's the very spot that God has chosen to be the political and religious center of the world during this millennial kingdom age. Now, speaking of those days, Daniel says, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now that's Daniel chapter two, verse 35. God's kingdom will be exalted above the kingdoms of the world. So this is what Isaiah is prophesying here, is this end time prophecy, which you can also read about in Revelation chapter 19, 20, and 21, that references the millennial reign of Christ. Well, Isaiah is prophesying this, which has not yet even occurred. So this is a prophecy that still pertains to you and I, as this will be the millennial reign post-tribulation, post-rapture. This is the time that Isaiah is talking about. Verse 2, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. 
Now, in this verse, we see the location of the temple. It is in the mountains. As the temple of God, we too must be in the mountains. Now, John Corson had this to say. He said, all throughout scripture, great things happen on a mountain. The word of God was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Mount Pisgah, or Pisgah, where Moses stood to see the promised land before he died. Then we have Mount Carmel, where Elisha called down fire from heaven. Uh, we have Mount Hermon, which is the scene of the Mount of Transfiguration. We have the Mount of Olives, where Jesus prayed. But the most important mountain as it relates to us is the Mount of Calvary, where Jesus willingly died and took the punishment that we deserve. We, too, should want to be Christians of the mountain, a person of prayer, a person who can look at people supernaturally, a person of vision, a person filled with the Spirit because of the incredible price that Jesus paid for me. I love that, that symbolism as it relates to the mountain. Now, secondly, in addition to the location of the temple, notice its elevation. It is the mountain above the hills, both corporately and individually. The Lord will take us as far as we want to go. The question is, how far do we want to go? Are you content to dwell in the hills or simply be saved and know you're going to heaven? Or do you want to go higher with the Lord? I thought about that. I said, okay. If the Lord will take us as high as we want to go, then every single one of us, and I would encourage you guys to do this, you need to ask this question. As it relates to the Lord's things and the Lord's kingdom and my time on this planet, how high do I want to go? How high up the mountain, how close to the Lord do I want to be during my time on planet Earth? Do I want to grind away? at my job, attending church here and there, and sharing Christ with a handful of people? Or do I want to go into full-time ministry and spend every waking hour in service to the Lord, right? So we have two, two extremes here, right? The, okay, I'm occasionally Christian, uh, and we even have occasional Christians that I would refer to as uh, consequential Christians, meaning if the consequences are bad enough, then they will be Christian. Uh, but if the, uh, if the situation is good, then my relationship with the Lord tends to wane, and I'm not as close with the Lord. Now, there's certainly more that each of us can be doing. I think we can all agree to that. There's more we all could be doing. But the question is, how motivated are we to serve the Lord? Now, there is no right or wrong answer here, and it is not my intent to in any way make people feel guilty or, or feel like they're under a yoke of bondage, like, oh, I got to go do something. No, it, it's, it's between you and the Lord. There is no right or wrong answer to this question, but it is a conversation that each one of us should be having with the Lord. Lord, what does living all out for you look like, right? If you want to pray that, just pray, Lord, what does living all out for you look like for me? What is it you would have me to do? If I were to commit an extra hour or two per week to serving you, where could you use me? Where would you have me to go? Whom would you have me serve? Who would you place in my path to share the gospel? Now, I mentioned this uh, last week, and I just want to mention it again here. Uh, last week, I asked you guys uh, to share with us, and by us, I mean the, the ministry, your ministry commitments for 2022. Now, I can tell you that this is the first time and the first time of ever that I've even heard of such a thing. Uh, now, I've been a Christian going on 40 years. Uh, and this is the first time as a Christian that I'm actually writing down my ministry commitments for 2022. Now, maybe you know I'm in a mastermind group called C12, which is a it's a mastermind group for Christian CEOs of companies, uh, and we meet every week and we have set curriculum that we go through. 
And the curriculum that we had about uh, four months ago, I want to say it was uh, November, October, November, as we were coming into 2022, uh, talked about your ministry goals. And I'd never heard such a thing. Ministry goals, what in the world is that? Well, we usually set financial goals for ourselves, right? It is a new year, so there's New Year's resolution. So many of you have, have resolved that, you know, this is the year that you're going to get fit and you're going to get healthy and you're going to lose some weight and you're going to exercise and you're going to spend more time with family and friends and you're going to you're going to take a vacation and you're going to go you're going to go somewhere this year. And right. So we we establish all these goals as it relates to our personal lives, our financial lives. But I had never set goals related to my ministry or my walk with the Lord. Now, I want to be clear here when I say my ministry, I'm referring to every single one of us, because you don't need to establish a 501c3 nonprofit, guys, to be a ministry. You are a ministry. Your life is a ministry. Your contribution to the Lord's things is a ministry. So you need to think of yourself and your relationship with the Lord and, and how you combine those two things to serve others as ministry. So this is not corporate, all right? This is not, you know, what, what am I going to do as it relates to my church? You know, how am I going to serve in my church? How do my goals align with my church's goals or my congregation goals? No. That's that's separate, okay? I'm talking about what are you going to do, okay? So there are three things here. What are your daily commitments for building your personal relationship with God? Number two, how will you be bold in your faith in 2022? And how will you serve in your local church and community in 2022? So I want you guys to write these down, and we're going to drop in a, a link. You can go and just download this form, fill it up, scan it, email it into uh, Donna at He's the Solution Ministries, and um, we're not going to, you know, check in on you on these things. We just want you to write these goals down and and let somebody else know what the goals are, right? And then as we get to the end of the year and we come into 2023, Lord willing, if we're still here, uh, then we can look back and say, how did I do? I'm really excited about this because I've been a goal setter for about 20 years of my career. I've always set financial goals, but this is the first year setting ministry goals. And so I'm excited to see what that does as it relates to just service to the Lord and service to others, because we will weekly as we go into our ministry meetings as a ministry partnership and team, as we review these, these KPIs, kingdom performance indicators, as we review these, we'll be able to tell, hey, are we headed in the right direction here? Now, last thing I want to mention, both before you fill out this sheet and before you send it in, pray about it. Say, Lord, what, what is it you would have me to do this year? So as we look to our own mountaintop experience with the Lord, as we look to get and draw closer to him. Now, this does not mean go higher. Uh, this is all figuratively. But by going higher, we're referring to getting closer to the Lord because he dwells high on a mountain. Okay. Now, remember, okay, this is the final cautionary tale as it relates to this. God did not create all of us to be the same person, to do the same things, and to serve in the same way. To some, he gave the gift of music. So for those of you that have that gift, then you're going to serve him with song. To others, he gave the gift of administration. So you're going to serve him with order and administering things. To others, he gave the gift of teaching. So you're going to serve by teaching others and equipping the body of the saints for the work of service. To some, he gave the gift of evangelism. Well, serve him by evangelizing. There is diversity within the unity of the church. And guys, the church is anyone who has called out to the name of the Lord Jesus and invited him into their heart and made him their Lord and Savior, okay? So when I say the church, I'm not referring to a building or a denomination. I'm referring to anyone who calls out to the name of the Lord Jesus and believes in the Jesus of the Bible, 
okay? God has so constructed the church that all the various individuals within it are to complement one another so that the whole thing is built up and matures. Okay? You never need to worry about stepping on ministerial toes if you are walking where the Lord has encouraged you to go. Okay, you do not need to be looking at somebody else is doing in their ministry and think I need to be doing that. No, God has a special calling specifically for you, for your skill set, for your background, for your network of people, for your sphere of influence, for the community that you live in. God has ordained your time on this planet right in this moment to accomplish his will, his task, his purpose. And it is different for all of us. Okay, second half of verse two. It will be raised above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Verse three, and many peoples will come and say, Guys, all nations will flow into it. All kinds of nationalities, all kinds of personalities, all kinds of economic backgrounds, education abilities will all flow into the temple of the Lord where he is serving and reigning. Lord, help us to continue to be a melting pot of all kinds of different people. Help us to avoid getting stuck in the rut of our usual congregational crowd. Let us seek diversity and inclusion in all that we do in your name and for your name. Now, the reason I wrote that, I think we can often get off course here as we become denominationally minded, meaning that, well, I'm a Baptist or I'm a Presbyterian or I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a Calvary chaplain, or I'm a, right, and, and everybody wants to lay claim to this is the way God wants us to be meeting, and this is the way God calls us to worship, and this is the way God fills us with the Spirit, and it's manifested through the speaking of tongues, and, 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 and the healing power of the Spirit, and, you know, the, the charismaticism. Look, <laughs> at the end of the day, when God wraps this thing up, brings home the tribulation saints, and then comes to earth and establishes his kingdom, we are all going to be worshiping him together. So if that is what eternity looks like, where we are all getting along, worshiping the Lord together, why can't we even at least attempt to do that here on earth? You know, we get so stuck in our denominational rut that, you know, if you're, if you're not of this church, then we can't, be, we can't be aligned. Well, look, everybody's got their own interpretation of things, and they are what I would refer to as the non-essentials. The essentials are, do you believe that Jesus is the miraculous son of God, born of a virgin in Bethlehem? who died on the cross at the age of 33, willingly gave up his life for the remission of our sins. And it's because of his blood and his death on the cross that we all have the promise of eternal salvation if we will merely receive the free gift that he has provided and offered through the death of his son on the cross, right? That is, that is fundamental Christianity. That is Christianity 101. And leave it to mankind to screw up the rest, right? And we now have all of these different buildings and denominations and beliefs and structure and order and the way that we meet, the way that we gather, and the songs that we sing or don't sing. And some sing hymns without music and others sing, you know, 7-Eleven songs and worship songs and modern day songs. And they have full bands and stages and lights and shows. And everybody wants to think they're wrong, they're wrong. What we're doing is right right. Man, we lose so much in the form of enthusiasm and motivation for the Lord's things when we want to press in against all these non, these denominational differences. 
when the Lord is in charge, when the Lord is king on, on this earth and we are all ruling and reigning with him, we're all going to get along. So I don't know why we couldn't get along now. Fourth, in the second half of verse three, it says this, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We see the motivation of the temple is to learn the way of the Lord. So why are all of these people coming to the, the mount, to the temple where Jesus is? It's because they want to learn the way of the Lord. Can you imagine, you know, getting on an airplane and flying to Jerusalem because the Lord is there. And we're going we're gonna to hang out with him and he's going to teach us and instruct us and train us. But we don't have to wait until the millennial reign of Christ to be doing that. We can do it right now because we should desire right now to be learning his truths and walking in his paths both government and religion will center in jerusalem the lord jesus christ will sit upon the throne of david one of the primary concerns of those who inhabit the earth will be to discover and do the will of god they will seek to learn his ways. They will walk in his paths. What an interesting time this will be. So glorious. Everyone who inhabits the earth at this time will be completely in love with Jesus and want nothing else to do but worship and praise him. I want you to just think about that. No more denomination. No more religiosity. No more distinctions no more false religions just christians in love with jesus that's going to be a very very cool time now as we go deeper here, you can understand now why there will be no wars i mean most wars stem in some way shape or form to jerusalem or some holy war that's been going on in the Middle East for thousands of years. It's a holy war. Everybody's trying to take the Temple Mount because they want to own the mountain where God's going to establish his kingdom so that they have the most exclusive and, and valuable piece of real estate on the entire planet. And everybody's fighting for this thing. But when the Lord is ruling and reigning during the millennial, everyone gets along. There's no wars. There's no famine. It's just going to be the most incredible time. Verse four, now this one threw me. Okay, so if this is such a, a incredibly peaceful time, why, verse four, he will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. Whoa, okay, this is like the millennial reign of Christ. Are you telling me that God's gonna be judging people? And correcting and settling disputes during the millennial reign of Christ, he will judge? Huh. So I'm confused. So I did some research. Now, this is uh, the best explanation that I found. This is uh, coming from a gentleman named John F. Walvoord who was the longtime president of Dallas Theological Seminary. He was one of the most prominent evangelical scholars of his generation, and he is considered perhaps the world's foremost interpreter of biblical prophecy. So I thought, all right, well, maybe this guy knows. So here's what he said. He said, the divine purpose of God for the Gentiles, that's you and me non-Jews, comes to its natural conclusion at the end of the times of the Gentiles, which is marked by the second coming of Jesus Christ. So Gentiles, got Jesus came back to earth, the rapture of the church, the bride of Christ, we are, he came back for us, okay? We have received our promise, Gentiles. 
The millennial reign, again, this is John Walford, the millennial reign of Christ primarily concerns the nation Israel and their restoration to their ancient land. Now, most of the prophecies dealing with the millennial kingdom describe Israel's day of glory and prominence with Christ as their king and David resurrected from the dead as the prince. So Jesus as king, David as prince. There are, however, numerous prophecies that indicate that the Gentiles also will participate in the millennial reign of Christ and will inherit many of the blessings which characterize this period. As the reign of Christ is from sea to sea, it necessarily goes far beyond the borders of the promised land outlined so long ago to Abraham as extending from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates, as we see in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. Okay, so what's going on here? Why then the judgment between the nations? Why the, why the settling of disputes? The nations is referred to the 12 tribes of Israel, and they're still going to be, you know, as, as Jesus now is sitting on the throne, and, and they're beginning to now understand all of the biblical prophecies that occurred. Again, this is post-tribulation, okay? The dead have raised, and now Jesus has established his kingdom as ruling. He's now going to, to settle disputes between the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, this verse is referring specifically to the tribes and Israel, the location. Meanwhile, Gentiles, non-Jews, we will be enjoying the most peaceful time planet Earth has ever seen. But we will continue to occupy the Earth across the globe. So this verse is referencing specifically Israel. But the rest of the verse, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take a sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. This refers to the rest of the world, the rest of the planet, where we will continue to occupy during this millennial reign of Christ. Now, at this point, I'm sure some of you are going, I got questions. Good, write them down, right? Write, write those questions down and bring them to Wednesday's discussion group, okay? That's, that's what it's for, is to answer any questions that you might have related to this topic. Now, here's a truth that I, I gleaned from this. God gave Isaiah the gift of seeing the future. At this time, God showed Isaiah what would eventually happen to Jerusalem. Revelations 21 depicts the glorious fulfillment of this prophecy in the new Jerusalem, where only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be allowed to enter. Sorry, hang on. God made a covenant promise with his people and will never break it. God's faithfulness gives us hope for the future. Finally, the last half of verse 4, we see the transformation. Nation will not take up war sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Swords become plowshares. Spears become burning hooks. Fighting is replaced by fruit. So here again, you know, I'm asking the question, why? Well, the rules of the Lord upon earth at this time will be righteous, and he will compel the nations to practice justice and fairness with each other. For the first time, all countries will dwell together in peace. Only during the kingdom age will the people be able to beat their swords into plowshares, meaning tools or implements of war will not be necessary during this time. Now, Joel chapter 3 verse 10 tells us that during the tribulation, just the opposite will be true. The people will beat their plowshares and swords. In fact, we're living in times like that right now. The idea of disarming nations and disarming individuals is, in my judgment, contrary to the word. So 
taking people's guns away from them right now is contrary to God's word. Now, this is not a time for us to in, insert our opinion about guns, okay? Now, for the record, I own guns, and I am pro-gun. Guns don't kill people. Sin kills people because sin is what puts a gun in the hand of a murderer. It is, guys, sin is the problem. Taking guns or weapons or knives or anything that you could kill somebody with is not going to create peace anywhere. Peace is created through the absence of sin, and the absence of sin is created by an acknowledgement and acceptance of Jesus Christ and his salvation. Now, that doesn't mean Christians never sin. We're all still sinners saved by grace. But until the millennial reign of Christ, as long as we are here on planet Earth, we are always going to be susceptible to sin. You know, I sinned just yesterday. I was driving with Preston and Andrea, and I came to a stop sign. And I did a California roll. You know, the one where you just kind of roll right through it. I mean, it's a two-way stop. There were no cars anywhere. So I just kind of rolled right through it. And Preston said to me, he says, Dan, are you supposed to stop? I said, well, it's recommended. <laughs> he said, well, what do you mean it's recommended? It says stop. Shouldn't you have stopped? I said, yes, Preston, I should have stopped. I said, unfortunately, I'm willing to pay the sin tax. He said, what's the sin tax? I said, that's the ticket you get for not stopping and following the rules, okay? In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus said this. Now, this is coming out of Luke chapter 11, verse 21. It says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. Now, why, if we are supposed to be disarmed, would Jesus himself say, when a strong man fully armed guards his own house? Not the government guards his house, not the police force guards his own house, a man fully armed. Now, you can spin this a million ways. Okay, so does that mean we're supposed to go out and get guns? Yeah. I'm not making a proclamation or declaration here. I believe that this, is, again, is, is, is something between you and the Lord. Now, pro-gun, praise the Lord. Anti-gun, you know, praise the Lord. But, you know, who's going to protect you? Yes, the Lord's going to protect you. But he says, when a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. So if you are going to have peace and safety, you must have law and order. Peace and safety in the absence of law and order do not exist, which is why, I don't know if you guys saw this article that came out last week in the Wall Street Journal, uh, the, or I think it was the Epic Times. The article said, city leaders admit that defunding the police is bad. <laughs> And I thought, really? It took you this long to figure that out. You actually thought that removing people of authority is going to reduce crime? Really? No, because you didn't reduce sin in the meantime. The only way you can defund the police is if you somehow reintroduce Jesus into our government and our court systems and our school districts. That's how you reduce crime. But as long as you continue to remove the Lord from anything and everything, crime is only going to go up. So defunding the police is not going to make people safer. Taking guns away from law-abiding citizens who know the law, follow the law, respect the law, is not going to make anybody safer. It's, it's, it's silliness. The prophecy of beating swords into plowshares will be fulfilled during the millennium when the Lord Jesus is reigning. Then you will be able to take the locks off your doors and you'll be able to walk the streets at night in safety. You will not and cannot during this millennium be drafted because there will be no more war. 
there will be no more need for weapons for defense. And the kingdom that the Lord is going to establish upon earth will be one of peace because he is the prince of peace. Now, J. Vernon McGee, in his commentary, he said this. It is futile, nonsensical, and asinine. Gotta love J. Vernon McGee. He actually used the word asinine. For any man or nation to promise to bring peace upon the earth today. Asinine. You're going to run for president under the promise of peace on earth. You are an idiot because it is not possible. The United Nations, which was founded to help bring peace on earth, is one of the greatest places to start fights and carry on battles. It has proven how impotent it is. It cannot bring peace on earth. It has only increased dictatorship on the earth, and we do not have peace in the world. If you are a child of God with your thinking cap on and begin to think God's thoughts after him, you will find that you are living in a big, bad, evil world. Now, you, didn't have, you can turn on the television for eight seconds and realize that very quickly. If you expect to see a brotherhood of all men, you are doomed to disappointment because man is not capable of bringing peace to this earth. There will be no peace as long as there is sin in the hearts of men and an overwhelming ambition to rule over others. There will be no peace. Verse 5, and we're going to start moving a lot faster. So for my time watchers, don't worry, we're, we're, right, we're right on pace, okay? Even though we're only on verse 5. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Finally, we see a beautiful invitation to enjoy the light and the love of the Lord. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. In view of the future that is coming, certainly we should walk in the light of the Lord. This is the only way of peace. When you leave God out, you will never have peace. Therefore, let us not use the word of God to chop others up and put others down. Instead, let's use it to plow and to prune that we might bear more fruit. How can we attract more people to Jesus? How can we encourage more to come and, and live in his ways and follow him and accept him? Because that is how we're going to get peace. You know, I, I, I think that the United States would do far more. By the way, the United States spent $1.7 trillion last year on weapons of war, everything related to war. Our, our departments and branches of, of, of security and safety, the Marine Corps, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, right? $1.7 trillion. What would happen if the United States of America spent that same money just getting the word of the Lord out, right? Sending out tracts, you know, backing Christian churches, backing missionaries, you know, and, and just investing all of that money helping people come to know Jesus. I think that the United States of America would be at far less risk of war if we spent that money just teaching others about Jesus. That's how we achieve peace everywhere is the introduction and adoption and incorporation of the things of the Lord. Verse 6, if, verse 6, you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob, they are full of superstitions from the east. They practice divination like the Philistines. Even as people in Isaiah's day were fascinated by the Babylonian and Syrian cultures with all their magic and mystery, where are people turning today? To eastern mysticism and spiritism. Muslim is one of the fastest growing religions on the planet right now. Why? Everybody's being drawn to it. Why? Because it's, it's what people of prominence are believing. So if it works for them, probably would be good for me. 
Verse seven, their land is full of silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses and there is no end to their chariots. Their land is full of idols and they bow down to the work of their hands to what their fingers have made. Like our own culture, the people of Judah were not only rich and prosperous and enamored with Eastern thought, but they had idols. Now theirs happened to be made of stone and wood while ours can be flesh and blood or chrome and rubber. Judah adopted new ideas from the heathens and incorporated them into their own religion. And they embrace all kinds of ways from Assyria and Babylon. And before long, they joined the rest of the nations in worshiping the creature more than the creator. So man will be brought low, verse 9. And mankind humbled, do not, forget, do not forgive them. Go into the rocks, hide in the ground, and dread from dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. The eyes of the arrogant man will be humbled, and the pride of men will be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. And the Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and they will be humbled. Under the, it is not idols, but only the Lord who will ultimately be exalted during this time. Under the reign of evil kings, idol worship flourished in both Israel and Judah. A few good kings in Judah stopped, stopped the other worship during their reigns. However, very few, though very few people worship carved or molded images today, we worship objects and symbolize power continues. We pay homage to cars. We pay homage to big homes, to sports stars, to celebrities, to money. We pay homage to all of these things. And idol worship is evil. Because number one, it insults God when we worship something he created rather than worshiping him. It keeps us from knowing and serving God when we put our confidence in anything other than him. And it causes us to rely on our own efforts rather than on God. God intends to break down the proud man, the man who thinks he can rule himself and the man who thinks he can rule the world without God is going down. The cedars of Lebanon, verse 13, tall and lofty, and all the oaks of Bashan. The cedars of Lebanon and the oaks of Bashan speak of men that are proud of their own abilities. Verse 14, and all the towering mountains and all the high hills. This verse refers to military might. I'm sorry, verse 14, towering mountains refers to government and society. That's the high hills. And for every lofty tower, verse 15, walls and towers speak of military might, which will be judged. Uh, every fortified wall speaks of commerce. Uh, for every trading ship speaks of commerce and merchandising. And for every stately vessel. Now, stately vessel, this speaks of the arts. Now, verses 13 through 16 speak of society as a whole, which is exalting itself. Now, God is going to put down all the pride and pomp of men. This is so important for all of us to remember. Not a one of us here is tired of politics. The professional sports team is using their status to have a voice, a voice contrary to what the Bible says. Celebrities now are stepping out and stepping up in droves to elevate sinful things and lifestyles that are popular in our day and age, but fly in direct contradiction to what the Bible says. If we have anything to say against any alternative lifestyle or people referring to themselves as he or she when they are exactly the opposite, or now we have people that are gender neutral, so I don't claim to be a boy or a girl, and we have people that are gender fluid, who today I choose to identify as a woman, and tomorrow maybe I'll choose to identify as a man. All of these things fly in direct contradiction to God's word, and yet 
people of prominence, people of wealth, people of power in government are telling us that we have to adopt and accept these things, or we are, we are, uh, we are bigots, we are racists, we are homophobes, we are all of these things. Well, how about I'm in love with Jesus and the Bible and the truths of the Bible, and all of these things are in direct contradiction to what God says we're supposed to be doing. But boy, if you speak out about any of these things, you are in big trouble. And unfortunately, I see more and more Christians becoming more and more polarized in their opinions, almost to a point of contempt. And I do not believe that these rants filled with religious sentiments are going to help. The only thing we as Christians need to focus on is that God has this all under control. He does not need us to defend his word. He does not need us to defend his reputation. He simply needs us to share the truth with everyone. He did not call us to be his defenders. He did. He called us to be his witnesses. He called us to be the conduit of his love and concern for every soul that does not yet know him. For every heart that has heard his word but continues to harden itself to his truths. Christian, the end for you and I is so incredibly glorious. I mean, what we are reading about here in chapter two, if you know Jesus is incredibly exciting, it's gonna be an amazing time. But you gotta understand, for everybody who does not accept Christ either now or during the tribulation period will be in hell during this time and for all eternity. So while you and I are here worshiping Jesus on the high hill, everyone who has not accepted him now or between now and the end of the tribulation period will spend eternity in hell. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You know, one of the challenges that people have with God and the Bible is God's not fair. He's not just. How could he do that? You know, if God is so just, then why are people getting sick? And why, why are people dying? And why would he create a thing called hell? He doesn't want anyone to perish. The reason that the rapture has not yet occurred is because there are still people on this planet that God knows are going to accept him as Lord and Savior, and he's merely giving them the time. He is a patient father, and he's giving them the time. It says to give everyone the opportunity to come to repentance. But there are also people on this planet who never will. Their hearts are so hardened against God that they will never come to know him. They will never acknowledge him. They are much too proud in who they are and what they are and what they have and what they've done. And they are so convinced of their, their own superiority that no other God could exist in their world other than them. And by, by the way, there is a very prominent religion out there that teaches you will become your own God. I mean, whoa, <laughs> how do people not see the hypocrisy of that? How are you going to be a God ruling and reigning in, an, in a millennial reign of Christ where he is the only king and Lord of lords, a mountain on a high hill? Sad that so many people have been duped into believing that stupidity. It's, it's just, it's, it's as J. Ryan would say, it was, it's asinine. Verse 17, the arrogance of man will be brought low and the pride of men humbled. And the Lord alone will be exalted in that day, and the idols will totally disappear. Men will flee to caves and the rocks and the holes in the ground from dread of the Lord and the splendor of his mighty when, it's, when he rises to shake the earth. In that day, men will throw away to the rodents and bats their idols and silver and idols of gold, which they made to worship. When the Lord comes back to this planet, before he rules and reigns in the temple, there will be a time of chastening and judging. And as a result, people will take all that they once worshipped to the dump to be left to the bats and the moles, because at last all idols will be seen to be meaningless. God 
is going to get rid of false religion. Verse 19, men will flee to caves. Now, if you look at the book of Revelation, I'm not going to have us turn there, but just write this down as a reference. Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 and 16 repeats this very thing. Here's what it says. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Wow. Now, Revelation occurred several thousand years after Isaiah wrote this chapter. And here he is right here, verse 19. Men will flee to caves into the rocks, into the holes of the ground from dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. Verse 21, and they will flee to caverns of the rocks and the overhanging crags from dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. Stop trusting in man who has but a breath in his nostrils of what account is he. God is saying here, do not look to man. You don't even know if he's going to have another breath. Instead, totally, fully, and only to me. So in closing, ah, I just got to raise attention. Yes, we're closing. In closing. All you see on television today has to do with the political economy, government, commerce, art, the pomp and pride of man, the religion and religiosity of man. And the day is coming when all of man's pride is going to be brought low and the Lord Jesus Christ will be exalted on earth. Now, I don't know whether men were ever cavemen or not, but a day is coming in the future when men are going back to the caves. So here's the application. Do not put your confidence in man. You and I breathe out, but we don't know whether we are going to breathe in or if we even get a next breath. That is the frailty of man. If he misses one breath, he's out of the picture, dead. Multitudes today going about their daily business will have fatal heart attacks and disappear from the earth's scene. How many people in the last 24 months have died from COVID or cancer or car accidents or old age or dementia or drug or overdoses? All of them gone. Exhorting man, looking to men for answers, looking to horoscopes for the future, meeting with palm readers, mediums, or hypnotists, following the latest self, self-help, get-rich-quick guru, or self-exalted prophet is not going to make your life on earth any easier. The pastors at the mega churches convincing you to live your best life now without acknowledging God's agenda, his will, or his purpose for your life is so incredibly short-sighted. We have so much more to look forward to. So don't put your confidence in a person or a group of people or a movement or a philosophy. Put your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. The life he has given you on this earth is the life you were meant to have. That doesn't mean you can't have more, earn more, be more. It simply means don't make that your focus. Make the Lord Jesus Christ your focus, and he will take care of the details of your life. And I want to end with this verse, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Please write this reference down. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, the words you just heard and hear every Sunday. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. 
But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I want to encourage you guys not to be looking at what everybody else is doing and being impressed by what they've accomplished or what they have, because the only thing that we should be focused on is what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing in and through us as it relates to his kingdom and sharing the gospel with him. That has to be primary. That has to be the main thing. We're going to keep the main thing, the main thing. And when we do that, God will take care of everything else. So you don't need to worry about the mortgage payment or the car payment or the job or the career or the deal. Is my focus on the things of the Lord? If yes, he's going to take care of the rest. If you are focused on all of the worries and concerns of this world to the point that you're not spending time with the Lord, then you're going to continue to struggle and be challenged through these things. We have to be focused solely on making sure we are walking with the Lord and doing and going where it is he would, he would have us to go. Don't put your hope in men. Put your hope in God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word this morning. Lord, and what a reminder this is. You have created this incredible future for every single one of us that know you. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to, to keep that at the forefront, Lord, as we, as we look at what's going on in this world, as we look at all the chaos and the commotion and the pain and the suffering and the death and the illness and the sickness. Lord, it is so easy to get discouraged. But Lord, you don't call us to be discouraged. You call us to be the light in all of this darkness. Lord, help us to be focused on you. Help us to draw our, our encouragement from you. Lord, help us to not look at the news and, and become discouraged. Lord, help us to look at, at, at how you're wrapping all this things, these things up and become encouraged to share and to, 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 to pray with people and to talk to them about you. Lord, I thank you for your plan. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for giving each and every one of us the opportunity to be a part of it. Lord, I pray that you would use each one of us in a mighty and powerful way. And Lord, that you would use this ministry to do just that, to minister to others. So Lord, we thank you for these truths. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing. We love you so very, very much. We ask you all these things now, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, I want to remind her, but if you need prayer, we certainly would love to pray with you. Anytime you need prayer, give us a call, 800-461-0216, 800-461-0216. Again, as a reminder, if you haven't booked your uh, Be Bold for Jesus tickets yet, you need to do that. Go to beboldforjesus.org. And also, guys, as a reminder, make sure you get me your ministry commitments for the year get those sent in as well. All right. Well, until next week, if we're still here, God bless you guys. Have a great, fantastic week. Put your faith in the Lord, and we'll see you guys next Sunday. Until then, God bless you. Goodbye, everybody.